Hi, new friends. Oh my gosh, this is this is starting to feel like home. Is these returning faces, and I'm like, I know you, I know you, I know you. Welcome. It's awesome having everyone here. Thank you for putting your numbers in the chat. We'll add you to the chat group and uh, keep you posted on the YouTube links. This is recorded, and we're going to dive right in. We are on page nine. Bill and I. For those who haven't joined us and are here for the first time, welcome, welcome, welcome. Stick around, stay with us the next hour. We dig around the big book and we're starting on page number in Bill's, uh, Bill's story. And uh, I read a bit. I get all nerdy. I'm a total, I'm just a little caveat for the new ones. I'm a total book nerd. Like I love this book. I eat, sleep and dream and breathe it. And then Bill comes in and he blows us away with his insight each time. So at the end of the meeting, we'll have Q&A where we get to shut up and we get to listen to you. I'm looking forward to that more than anything. <laughs> Page nine, uh, second paragraph. No, sorry, third paragraph. I pushed a drink. So a little bit of backstory. Ebby has come to visit Bill. Bill is at the absolute end. He's done. He's fried and he gets a phone call from an old drinking buddy. And this man walks to his front door and there's a miracle. And Bill has just seen him. He's just opened the door. He's blown away. There's this fresh faced glowing man who used to be his biggest drinking buddy. And they sit down in the kitchen. I pushed a drink across the table. He refused it. Disappointed, but curious, I wondered what had got into the fellow. He wasn't himself, because no memory of Bill has he ever remembered Ebby to refuse a drink. And you know why? Because he can. He can refuse a drink. He's got a power greater than he's been rearranged. He can refuse a drink, because I couldn't. And remember, Bill, just prior to this, was running on the tram armistice day, down and out, beating new alcohol was his master. He meets up with the guy, they get chatting, and the tram breaks down and they go, they've got to go into the local speakeasy to wait, you know, till things get, you know, till they can get moving. And a drink is pushed his way. And after he's told his whole sob story and how done he is, done, 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 he picks up a drink. Why? Because Bill has got no solution. He knows he's done, but he's got no solution. Ebby knows he's done, and he's got a solution. Just for the Come record, on. because they weren't here last week, Nadia, yeah. Bill talks about starting a drink on Armistice Day. He had been sober a few months. November 11th is Armistice Day over here. It's been changed to Veterans Day. Leading up to this, near the end of that bleak November, so Bill's been on at least a 15-day drunk right now. He's not going out and drinking one night and running back to a fellowship and saying, I slipped or relapsed or whatever term we give for the lapse back into the insanity of the first drink. He's at the point where once he starts the craving in motion, he doesn't put it off. This is at least a 15 or 18 day drunk he's at the end of the month he started at the, at the yeah, on the 11th day just for a record for anyone who wasn't here last week this is when this drunk began so he didn't go out last night and get a dui he opened the the allergy and it's consuming him one day at a time it's all over him and in the door walks the grace of god his friend who has a solution Come on, what's this all about? I queried. He looked straight at me. Simple. Simply but smilingly, he said, I've got religion. So, all right, all right. I just want to say for the newcomers that are here that are like, oh, I knew it. No, no, no. Just hang on with us. We're telling a story. So this is the Oxford group. Ebby had found the Oxford group. Well, they'd found him, actually. Bill can go into that now now because I've I've just lost it. But I know it was in a in a court case Roland has that came. Um, and they presented the tenets of the Oxford group, which was deeply Christian. And these guys were staying sober. They were being, they were having a spiritual experience, 
and they were staying sober and they were going out and well the courts were hearing about them that there was success stories coming from the Oxford group so they were asking the magistrates were asking these guys to come to the courts to intercede or to help <laughs> these returning drunks so that's what happened. That, that's what Evie's saying to Bill. He's like, I got religion. Something interesting spiritual has happened to him. That, everything now that does she cross-references with the book. So they're going to talk about an experience of a guy, Roland Hazard, who had gone to Europe. I'm not going to attempt to do what Steve does with this story. But Roland Hazard was in the same atmosphere that Abby Thatcher was. And to say that is because not just said other people had placed themselves in whatever this atmosphere was and had these changes, which took away the obsession to drink. The allergies never eradicated. If we have the allergy once, the doctor's opinion tells us it never, ever, ever occurs in a non-alcoholic. So whether I've had the phenomenon of craving one time where I start to drink and I get thirstier with each drink, or if it now is happening every time, I have the physical component called alcoholism. Roland Hazard was a guy who went to Europe because he had exhausted every remedy that he could in the United States and placed himself under the care of Dr. Carl Jung for a year. And he got drunk on the way back home after he believed that he knew everything that was necessary to never drink again. He didn't even make it back to his country. And he ended up wrote, uh, Dr. Young told him, Roland, here and there, once in a while, alcoholics have had these vital spiritual experiences. And it's a powerful book. Rob puts a copy of it up here. It's Bill W., the first 40 years. And the description is, Roland Hazard tells Carl Young that he's willing to do anything. He said, I must have this thing. Where do I find it? And Carl Young says to him, that's the problem. I don't know. You can only place yourself in some type of conversion atmosphere. Uh, some Christian, I guess, would be, for lack of a better word, something where a spirit comes in and drives this demon out. But I don't know where you'll find it. And he ended up in the Oxford groups where Evie ended up in their morning meditation. What they called an 11th step back then is they would get quiet and do some in out meditation and prayer where they would break themselves up a room of them and get in separate places. And they would call on God and get quiet. And then they would write whatever came to their mind and they would get together with the rest of the group to see if it was God's talking or just wishful thinking. Abby got the idea of his friend, Bill Wilson, and how he could call on him. The thinking was outside of himself. So he's making the call to Bill. But when he said, I've got religion, that's what it was known. It was first century Christianity, a moral armament or rearmament, whatever the name of it was. But it was the Oxford group. And these were people that had a conversion and realized that they must have confession of their sins or shortcomings and obviously be of service because that was what the master had told them to serve. So it's a tremendous history story. And there's a book with much more inflection and passion when you read where, where Bill's coming up to and what I want to say, and then I'll be quiet, I think, is he stays on his trunk for another couple of weeks because his last day of his drink is December 12th. So he picks up a drink on November 11th, and he finally gets off the drunk that he's on a month later. Okay, Nadja, that's enough for me. Maybe not. Is she having a bad internet again, Rob? Is she still here? No, she's gone. She's back. I thought for sure I offended her for good, but not not <laughs> She's back. Sorry, guys. I'm back. That'll be the last, I'm sure. We've just had some really, yeah. I think it's a solar storm or whatever is going on. Sorry, I missed all of that, Bill. I'll catch it on the recording. Page nine. Sorry, I just want to get back to where I'm at. One, two, three, the fourth paragraph. I was aghast. So that was it. Last summer, an alcoholic crackpot, 
Now, I suspected a little cracked about religion. He had that starry-eyed look. Yep, the old boy was on fire, all right. But bless his heart, let him rant. Besides, my gin would last longer than his preaching. Like, <laughs> yes, this, so I just want all of you just to take stock of what's going on here. We've got Bill deep in this alcoholic thinking, right? That alky spirit is just raging inside of him. Yes, Ebby, an absolute miracle, glowing, shining, smiling, happy, sober, and happy. I mean, that's that's the real deal, right? And Bill's eyes are, I mean, he cannot deny what he's seeing, but his mind, his alcoholic mind is just snapping shut. It's just snapping shut. Every time Bill has this moment of like, wow, something really amazing. Then, oh, no, that's, yeah, yeah, typical. He's a little Bible basher. He's coming here now to save my soul and have me put money in that tithing on a Sunday. That's all he's about. Like, that all those old ideas are just coming in and they're trying to swallow Bill. Just, just watch how that happens down the rest of this. Bill has this moment of like, wow, and then he gets swallowed back in again. It's that powerful alcoholic thinking. So he goes, but he did no ranting. In a matter of fact way, he told how two men had appeared in court Persuading the judge to suspend his commitment, they had told of a simple religious idea, step two, and a practical program of action, step four through to nine, that was two months ago. And the result was self-evident. It worked. Now, there's a lot in this, this little paragraph here. Ebby didn't stand and shout from a mountaintop. He didn't stand no axes to grind, no lectures to be endured. In in a little bit later on in the book, it talks about how we carry the message. And number two, you know, I've heard some people, and we were talking about this just before the, the meeting started, how some of the meetings that I've been attending and, and others in the room that are doing service here, there's a very watered down message in the meetings. And I'm not doing this in a divisive spirit at all at all but i've heard things like one month one step one year one step i mean can you imagine bill and bob doing one year one step or one month one step there are so many indicators to how this program needs to be done time wise you know because we come in here and we want to know tell me how to do this tell me how quickly this needs to be done this was two months ago and ebby's carrying the message Ebi is approaching, he's making the approach to go and sponsor Bill. I mean, that's that's the, that's not like a year, a step, not a month, a step. Two months ago, this thing can be, be done quickly. And the result was evident. It worked. He came to pass his experience along to me, if I cared to have it. <laughs> I was shocked, but interested. Certainly I was interested, I had to be, for I was hopeless. Bill, step one, remember he's conceded that alcohol is his master. He talked for hours, childhood memories rose before me. I could almost hear the sound of the preacher's voice as I sat on still Sundays, way over there on the hillside. There was that proffered temperance pledge I never signed. My grandfather's good-natured contempt of some church folks and their doings. His insistence that the spheres really had their own music. But his denial of the preacher right to tell him how he must listen. His fearlessness, fearlessness as he spoke of these things just before he died. These recollections welled up from the past. They made me swallow hard. So there's, uh, Bill's grandfather. So I, d I don't know if any of you know this. I think we have shared this before. Bill, Bill was raised by his grandfather and his grandmother. So, you know, there's, there's like, there's abandonment. I mean, he wasn't raised by his mom and dad. He was raised by his grandfather who, from what I understand, and I think Bill, I think you've got quite a bit here. You've shared with me quite a bit on this paragraph before. Um, how his grandfather 
wasn't an atheist, but he didn't believe in the, the church, the ways of the church, and the churches weren't very welcoming to him either, right? Um, but he does remember his grandfather having some manner of spiritual life, some manner of spiritual practices. There was something spiritual passed on to Bill as a child. And the reference that he makes here is that his insistence that the spheres really had their own music. His grandfather knew there was something out there. His grandfather knew there was a creator. But it wasn't that dogmatic religious God that the churches were talking about. And this is where Bill's mind is going. He's he's remembering that, but he's also remembering that there was a spiritual experience as a child. So there's a lot going on here. That head of his is just, it's finding a way out. It's trying to find out. It's trying to grasp at this flimsy little reed that's been put in front of him. And you remember it it's uh, on page one, it talks about him going to the Win into Winchester Cathedral mm -hmm. on his way to war. He said, inside the cathedral, maybe the shortest line or paragraph in this book says, much moved. Something took place in the cathedral, and now here it is X amount of years and 10 pages later. And it says that wartime day in old Winchester Cathedral came back again. He's going to talk about it one more time. Something profoundly happened to him in that cathedral. He had an experience of spirit. And as he'll explain on page 12, any time that he had needed God and wanted God and humbly asked, God had come. He said it had been so ever since the day in the cathedral, how blind he had been because worldly clamors, mostly those within himself, pomposity, worship, people adoring his great achievements on Wall Street, blotted out the connection. That's why this is so important. And when that became to him in this new condition, there's been some a new theme going on in AA, and I sometimes when things don't settle right with my spirit, I look at them or pray on them. And some people say, I was separated from alcohol, as Bill said. Bill went into a detox, which means he detoxified. If I'm separated from alcohol by the hand of God, I don't need to do anything else because I've solved the problem. Separation of, from alcohol is not my solution. It's the beginning of a lifelong reconstruction. And what happened with Ebby? was so tremendous that he came to Bill, not because he was afraid he was going to drink. He came to Bill because when the Spirit of God enters in us and we make clear that channel, we can't keep it. We can't contain it. We have to give it away, not because, not because we're compelled to. It's because we can't contain it. We want to share it. And that's what took place, and that's what takes place in AA. If you're coming in here and just not drinking and think you got the benefit of Alcoholics Anonymous, I assure you from my own experience in the nature of this disease, the great thirst to take the first drink will be upon you before you know it. If you take these steps and have an awakening of the spirit, alcohol won't even be a consideration because you can't, you won't even have time to think about it. You'll be so busy trying to pass along this spiritual experience to your next fallen brother. That's the magic of AA, not the fact that we get sober. The fact is we access the kingdom within, and the only way that we can seem to get relief from, from having it inside of us is we have to give it away just so we don't explode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, man, that's why we do what we're doing here. We love this. We love this. We love this so much. I had always, page 10, second, third paragraph, because there's a tiny little paragraph, number two, but now we're on the third one. I had always believed in a power greater than myself. I had often pondered these things. I was not an atheist. Few people really are. For that means blind faith in the strange proposition that this universe universe originated in a cipher and aimlessly rushes nowhere. My intellectual heroes, the chemists, the astronomers, even the evolutionists suggested vast laws and forces at work. 
Despite contrary indications, I had little doubt that a mighty purpose and rhythm underlay all. How could there be so much of precise and immutable law and no intelligence? I simply had to believe in a spirit of the universe who knew neither time nor limitation. But that was as far as I had gone. So Bill does believe in the God of science. And he believes in, in the God of nature. So he has got a faith. He's believed in something because he, he's got intellectual heroes and, and chemists and astronomers that he's followed and, and read and, you know, followed, like on Facebook, I suppose. Would it be like that? Yeah. <laughs> and, and hearing that the ciphers, you know, this, the, the galaxies, oh, my gosh, there's this amazing YouTube um, link that I watched the other day about the planets that have their own music. Because I went, when I was preparing this, I was like, the spheres, okay, so spheres is planets. And I went and Googled it. I was like, do spheres have, do planets have their own music? And they dink them do. Jupiter has its own sound. It's quite eerie, but check it out. Maybe I'll drop it in our WhatsApp chat. Maybe just that little link. It's, it's really pretty awesome. The thing is, I digress, Bill, did believe in a God of some sorts. There was something going on here. But that's as far as he's gone. Now, the whole time, Ebi is busy telling him about what's happened and this miracle and all the people he's met and the good work he's done and he's carrying on. And Bill's up in his head going, could it be? No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. And, and we, we're, we're carrying on with Bill. We're in Bill's head right now. With ministers and the world's religions, I parted right there. That's it. Don't bring no church ministers near me. Don't talk about no church pews. Don't bring no Bible. None of that stuff. Dum. He's parted. He wants nothing to do with that. And when they talked of a God personal to me, who has love, superhuman strength and direction, he has some really beautiful, beautiful adjectives for your sponsee or your newcomer or your relapser who's just come back in, the one that you're working with, your prospect, shoulder to shoulder, if they're struggling with concepts of God's character or God's being, God's nature, here is a few here. He knows no time, no limitation. A couple of lines up. He's, a, he's personal to us. He, God is love. God is superhuman strength. God is direction. There's some, some beautiful ideas about who and what God is. But I became irritated and my mind snapped shut. Boom, like a boom gate, down against such a theory. No, 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 no. That, none of that. None of that airy, fairy, fluffy God loves me stuff. No, thank you very much. Bill is an intellectual. He studies. He gives tips to all seat brokers. He don't want none of that kind, soft, gentle-hearted stuff, okay? <laughs> Listen to what he says here. To Christ, I conceded the certainty of a great man, not too closely followed by those who claimed him. So yes, okay, Jesus Christ was pretty awesome. He did pretty cool stuff. But those that do follow him, have you seen how they are? Honestly, they're all like, you know, holier than thou. And what are they doing Monday? They're gambling. They're Netflixing. They're you know, visiting dodgy places, doing dodgy things. So they don't, you know, he, he's not even, he, the Christians don't even do the proper thing. Like, no, this is not for me. Thank you very much. His moral teaching, most excellent for myself, I had adopted those parts which seemed convenient and not too difficult. The rest I disregarded. <laughs> so Bill, Bill saw Christianity and he picked and chose what was easy and really nice and, and nice for him, like the Ten Commandments. Maybe he took one or two. The rest he didn't live by at all. I didn't live by any of those. I remember when I first heard about the Ten Commandments in church. I was a kid. I love church, by the way. But I remember my first thought being, oh, no, I'm in a lot of trouble because I've broken like at least four of them. I'm in a lot of trouble. I'm going to help. And, you know, that tiny little thought that I had when I was maybe seven, eight, nine, that tiny little thought became a massive, monstrous pink slip for me when I was about 14. Because I had this attitude of like, you know what? 
if I'm going to hell, I might as well jump on this gravy train and ride this thing all the way, mama, right into the pits of hell, which I did, which I did. Anyway. The wars which had been fought, the burnings and chicanery that religious dispute had facilitated made me sick. Chicanery, I had to go Google that because I don't know, do we use words like that these days? There's a lot of really cool words here that we don't use anymore, but this one is tricks and lies. So Bill's prejudice is just risen right up here. His mind snapped shut. He's got all these old ideas just telling him this deal is not for you, Bill. Whatever this dude is doing or whatever he's talking about because he's got religion, that's all Bill heard. Boom. And his mind came shut down. I honestly doubted whether on balance the religions of mankind had done any good. Judging from what I had seen in Europe and since, the power of God in human affairs was negligible. The brotherhood of man, a grim jest, a sick joke. If there was a devil, he seemed the boss universal, and he certainly had me. I just want to give us a tiny little read the fine print here. Um, maybe, Rob, you can put it in the chat. I just, while I was reading this, I was thinking to myself, there are some people in this room, newcomers perhaps, or maybe still those who the word God makes their whole, everything just rise up. Yes, we are in a time, especially now, and I'm not going to talk about outside issues, but especially now we're seeing a lot of what he's talking about here. Because Bill had seen a lot of this. He'd been in a war, you know? So he had seen unfair deaths and murder and destruction like we are seeing as well today. But there is a line in the big book that says, any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. And we are in a world of 7 billion people Running a life on self-will, things are not a success at the moment. I just want to put that little caveat in there, that little fine print. But my friend, we're on page 11, we're on the second, we're on the second paragraph halfway through. But my friend sat before me, Ebby, is in front of Bill. And he made the point blank declaration that God had done for him what he could not do for himself. Where, where have we heard that before? That's one of the nine step promises, right? That we read at every meeting. Well, at every meeting I go to, they call them the promises, but they're only, they're only, they're only 12 of like, I think almost 256. And then my friend Paige calls, uh, says there's some sneaky promises. So there's a whole bunch more in this big book. His human will had failed. Doctors had pronounced him incurable. Society was about to lock him up. Is this not where Bill was? Is this not where Bill was just like a couple of weeks ago where the doctor had said to Lois, we're either going to lock him up here or let, take him home, let him go die at home. This is exactly where he was. But this is not a dying man sitting in front of Bill, right? Because then he had, in effect, been raised from the dead, suddenly taken from the scrap heap to a level of life better than the best he had ever known. Where else is that amazing promise in this book? Raised from the dead. Let's go look. Page 63. Hey, we haven't bounced around the big book at all tonight. Let's go. Page 63. The first paragraph, the last sentence. We were reborn. That's for sure the case. He recognizes his friend, but there's something completely different about him. He has been risen from the dead. And that's every meeting I go to and I look at these Hollywood squares, I always, there's that little line, this line that just reminds me that I'm looking at people who have been raised from the dead because we were dead men walking and women. Had this originated in him? Obviously it had not. There had been no more power in him than there was in me in that minute, and that, that this was none at all. 
I also just want to take you, sorry, I just want to back up a little bit, back up, reverse a little bit. Suddenly taken from the scrap heap to a level of life better than the best he had ever known. If you've ever wondered what's a spiritual awakening, and you can go read it in the appendix in 567, that's a one-liner of what a spiritual awakening looks, sounds, and feels like. That floored me. It began to look as though religious people... <laughs> It began to look as though religious people were right after all. <laughs> now, I guess something really cool happening. Bill is starting to open up. His mind is starting to open up. So there's, there's willingness, open-mindedness, and we're going to ask for some honesty because these are the essentials for recovery. This is what your sponsor, your newcomer, needs to bring to the table. And now Bill's mind is starting to open up. Maybe, just maybe these people might be right. Maybe. What a beautiful word. Here was something at work in a human heart which had done the impossible. My ideas. That's a key word. That's a key word. Circle that. Ideas, thinking, alcoholic mind. About miracles were drastically revised right then. Never mind the musty past. Here sat a miracle directly across the kitchen table. He shouted, great tidings. This is when Bill realizes this man is sober and he's happy. And all of a sudden, he starts having, a, like he's having a, a moment here. Something's happening. He was, I saw that my friend was much more than inwardly reorganized. He was on a different footing. His roots grasped a new soil. Despite the living example of my friend, there remained in me the vestiges of my old prejudice. There's those old ideas. Remember page 58? We, some of us, tried to hold on to our old ideas and the result was, no, he's just about a having, he's just, he's just opening up and whoops, here comes the old prejudices again. Here it comes. Because obviously, if he's chatting and he's chatting and he's using the word God, and he's like, God did this for me. And I was sitting, and then I went to a hospital bed and I spoke to someone else about God and God. And Bill can just hear God, God. And Bill's like, mm -mm. and then the mind starts snapping shut again. And what does he say? Exactly. He says, the word God still raised antipathy. He's, he's now just declared that there is a miracle sitting in front of him, but that word God, uh-uh. No, thank you. Not for me. No. And this is what blocks us. Old ideas, our prejudice, old ideas, false beliefs, things that we've clung onto that we've told ourselves, it blocks us. Bill was opening up and then it gets blocked again. When the thought, Abby, there it is. is it, yeah. You know, I've been quiet for 15 minutes. Uh, not that it matters. Now I have something I want to say. Bill drank after that experience in the kitchen with Ebby. In fact, as I said, he doesn't get sober for a couple more weeks, but I believe he had a little dry spell in between there. And when Ebby came and visited him again in the hospital, he didn't beat him up with that mentality. Like, you know, he didn't, he didn't beat him up with his conversion experience and he didn't make Bill feel bad. He might have been the first one to understand that he was still sober only by the grace of God. And when he came to Bill, he didn't, he, Bill said he was afraid that he was going to belittle him or do what we do to each other out of ignorance. And he said he didn't do any preaching or ranting anymore. He said, Bill, I'm, I'm sorry that you have to be here in this condition again. He didn't make it unattractive. And when you had talked about where uh, he said, had the power originated in Ebby? Obviously not. He had no more power than I did, which was none at all. But at the top of the preceding page, it talked about, of course, Bill was interested because he was hopeless. Alcoholics Anonymous tends to work a lot better when I come in here hopeless 
at the end of the road rather than when I'm on the acceleration ramp or in the slow lane on the highway. They got nowhere to go. And I mean, there is such a such a descript narrative in, in the book that Rob keeps posting these things on. It really touches your heart. When Bill's having it, you talked about we're getting inside of Bill's thinking. And when he's sitting there, he's debating in his mind. He thinks Ebby's crazy, right? He's a religious crackpot, but he said, Ebby's sober and I'm not, maybe I'm crazy. And then he says, he stares into the abyss as if he's looking into at the face of the devil and he says the abyss is getting ready to swallow him up and he says this he said with no faith or hope i cried out to a god that i didn't believe in and said if there is a god let him show himself see the gift is when you get to the end of the road and there's nothing left but god that's when the experience is so sensational you can't deny it and when he describes on this page in the next paragraph, I don't want to steal your thunder, but he says the experience of the cathedral burst upon him in the present moment, not back in 19 wherever. That day, he had recalled what he had experienced and realized at that time that he was in the presence of infinite power and love, that, that, that spiritual principle that we call God and how it had been pushed to the side based on all the things that he thought he wanted in life. And the word speculation means thinking, his drinking and speculation, his thoughts, his thinking and his drinking brought him to the point of self-destruction. And he realized much like this is not new, like you said, like uh, the guy who wrote the Song of Solomon's, it's all vanity, it's all for naught. The things that are valuable in life are the things that are deep down inside of us, not the things that we try and clamor for from without. And the reality is you can't take none of them with you when you go, right? They don't have U-Hauls following Hertz. Isn't that amazing, all the stuff we waste our time on trying to get? And what Alcoholics Anonymous about is a homecoming. We're going back to the image and likeness of God, which is love. At three years old, I didn't have a bank account, and I didn't know if I did that it was shallow. Who cares at three years old? I had innocence, and I drank it away and lied it away and stole it away and sipped it away in everything that I did to put something in between me and the only thing that would ever satisfy me, which is God. But because of his faithfulness, his love, his mercy, his compassion, his grace, all those principles that I claim to live by, that sustain in one out in time, that at the end of the road, when I cried out for help, he had been here the whole time. Isn't that amazing? It's like, welcome home. That's what they say in AA, welcome home. Wow. Been looking for you guys all my life. I never knew I found you in the truancy office back in the sixth grade. Oh, and we're so glad you've come home. I love that. Thank you. Page 12, second paragraph, third line. When the thought was expressed that there might be a God personal to me, this feeling, there's another very important word. This is the alcoholic mind at play. Thoughts, feelings, feelings are real. Thoughts are real. This is, it's just, it's just blocking him. I didn't like the idea. This is the, this is self, 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 thought, feeling, idea, self, self's in the way. I could go for such conceptions as creative intelligence. There's an idea. If you don't like the word God, use the word creative intelligence, universal mind. If you don't like the word God, use, use the universal mind or spirit of nature. But I resist the thought. <laughs> Okay, now self is like going up against itself here of a czar of the head of heavens. I also resisted the thought of a big guy in the sky with the book and the big beard and the, you know, filming me and couldn't wait to get me to heaven, the gates and tell me you're not coming in, you're going that way. You know, tell me all the bad things I had done. I also didn't like that idea. But it was going through these pages and having someone say to me, Nadia, here are other terms. Here's some 
characteristics of this God that you've only only ever given judgmental judgmental um um what's it con conditional love like those that was the kind of God I walked into these rooms with a little finite human God and yeah I get given and you know what you know what and I've said this before the fact that we have this book tells me that there's something that adores the socks off me and all of you. Because I have my whole life been walking around like everybody else has a manual to life and I don't. I do. I do. However loving his sway might be, I have since talked with scores of men that felt the same way. My friend suggested what then seemed a novel idea. He said, why don't you choose your own conception of God? Do this your own way. Find and name your own God, guys. Whoever is in here and still struggling with the word and still struggling with the fact that there's a power out there that's got to run the show. But, you know? When I came in here, I was like, I don't want this big guy in the sky. He freaks me out. I don't like it. No, no, no. This is not for me. Just like Bill. Regardless of the fact that I had miracles around me. And yeah. And then God kind of like morphed. So, so then I sat down and I remember my sponsor. Her first thing to me was Nadia. Caring and protecting, right? We've, we've highlighted that a few times. Those are two characteristics of the God that we're speaking about in here. Who was caring? Because now you're telling me God, the father, God, the mother, uh, 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 uh. because I didn't have good experiences with either. So no, 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 that I'm not buying into that either. So she was like, okay, who in your life can you remember was caring and was protecting? Now in South Africa, we, okay, we've got a, we've got this checkered past, but we've had people who come and they, they take care of your house and they clean your house and they take care of your children the most amazing human beings that I've ever, ever lived with. That was my God, was a woman that didn't have the same skin color as me, whose hair wasn't the same texture as mine, who was much larger than me, who ate food very different to me, whose music was very different to me, who spoke a different language, but she raised me when my mom was working and my dad was nowhere to be found. This woman who didn't speak the same language or look or talk or eat the same food at all nothing about it was like anything like where I came from but she cared and protected for me so her face her beautiful face with her beautiful soft brown cheeks and her big black eyes she was my god for a long time early recovery because I had to find something anyway that's just that was my experience it was really cool that was my step two experience so choose your own conception of god Let's go see, where else in the book does it talk about this? Page 46. Let's go see what it says on page 46. Because this book repeats itself a few times and then it spells itself out again, you know. Bill knew. We needed things repeated and we needed things spelled out to us differently. So 46, chapter, th uh, paragraph 3. Here it is. Here it is. Much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God. Our own conception, however inadequate, my childhood, my childhood carer, I don't care. That was an, in, maybe not for you guys. Like, why would you believe in someone like to care of her? Well, that's what got me through those, that first year that I needed. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient, was sufficient enough it's enough just something just a little bit of something it doesn't have to be the whole bang shoot right now this book meets us where we're at to make yeah. the approach and to effect contact that you will say one more thing and this can't be cross-checked but bill was drinking when he had that conversation with ebby when me and Bill, when me and Rob interviewed Ebby, here's what Ebby said he said to Bill. He said, Bill, why don't you have your own experience with God? See, when you're talking about someone else's conception, 
what that means is I, I noticed how you talked about earlier you read the ten commandments and knew you were in trouble the ten commandments don't tell you you're going to hell if you broke them someone who was further along the road less traveled told you that nonsense so when i talked to my sponsor about that these rules that seemed to be breached and there was a lot of trouble he said i believe that the first commandment says i am the lord your god he said, sounds like God as you understand me. And then the second stanza in that first commandment says, thou shalt have no strange or other gods before me. But what we do, because we need to be right, is we inflict on you as much as you will take it before there's religious chicanery or wars fought. We will try and compel on you to take our conception of God so we can so that we can be right. And what happens is if you weren't designed to contain that conception, you have to revolt against it. So what happens is I'm fighting something for my own good because someone's trying to impress on me something that doesn't fit my jigsaw puzzle, it fits theirs. And what happens is because of this, what seems like a curse becomes a blessing is I'm shredded to the point where I cry out, I'll do anything. And all of a sudden, my experience with God becomes unshakable because I've experienced it. I wasn't, I didn't learn it and I wasn't told about it. It wasn't your conception, your experience, your revelation. It was mine. And just like each one of us have our own fingerprint, independent of every other one of us, we all have the fingerprint or the DNA of God as he created us. And that little revelation came when I realized that my mom has four children. We all look at her different. We all have different needs. And she treated us all differently, dependent upon our needs. But it didn't change the fact that A, she was mom, and B, it didn't change the nature of our mother. It was just our interpretation, our perception at the time. There were times I probably got mad at my mom when she didn't do what I wanted. Probably no differently than I got mad at God when he didn't do what I wanted. But that seemed to be constant because he never did what I wanted. And thank God he didn't. It wouldn't have been good for me or anyone else. But we just got to get all those cobwebs out of our head, and it takes an atomic blast. And alcoholism is quite capable of delivering that blast. It's amazing. Everything's backwards in my life till I surrender. Thank you so much, Nadia. You know I've got to leave this meeting here. But I will be back. Sarno Schwarzenegger says I will be, I'll be back. Love you, Bill Swan. See you when you get back next week, Monday. All right, we still got time, do we? Yep, we do. Shall we keep going, Rob? Okay. There's another place that I want to take you here. When Bill, when Abby says to him, why don't you try your own concept? Why don't you try your own experience of God? This, there's another place where they talk about this is on page 47. And it's the step to question it's the second paragraph do i now believe or am i even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself bill are you can you now believe or are you even willing to believe that there's a power greater than yourself there it is step two boom you've taken it yes yes that's all you got to do just maybe that's what we're asking. Just say maybe. That statement hit me hard. It melted the icy intellectual mountain in whose shadow I had lived and shivered many years. Frozen, hard, solid. Bill had been trapped, solidified in his belief system, in his old ideas. This Church God is no good. God is no good. Probably didn't delve to me. He says he did ponder on some of it. He pondered on some of it, but he didn't have a life dedicated to this or walking with this power. He was frozen off, cut off from it. And yeah, all of a sudden, the father of light shines on Bill. And the melting process starts. 
It was only a matter of being willing to believe in a power greater than myself. Nothing more was required of me to make my beginning. I made a note here. Let's go. Page 317. What's there? Let's go look. Page 317. Oh, yes. We're talking about the essentials here. So I said to you, Nana, that Bill's mind was starting to open and then it snapped shut and then it opens and it snapped shut. So there are three things that we ask you as a newcomer or as a returning um, member to, to bring to the table is honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. And here's a little, a little, a little uh, bitty on, on willingness. Page 317, it's the third paragraph. When I'm willing to do the right thing, I am rewarded with an inner peace no amount of liquor could ever provide. When I am unwilling to do the right thing, I become restless, irritable, and discontent. They talk about that in the doctor's opinion, right? It is always my choice. You see, we don't have a choice of whether we drink or how much we drink. We don't have a choice of when we're going to stop or when we're not going to stop. But we do come. So we come in here powerless, hopeless, hopeless mind, state of mind and body. But the reason I'm pointing you to this is you have got a choice here. You've got a choice to bring willingness open-mindedness and honesty to the table. You have got the power to bring those things, those three things to the table. And yeah, we're seeing, yeah, we're seeing Bill's willingness. I saw that growth could start from that point. Upon a foundation, we're back on page 12, third paragraph, upon a foundation of complete willingness, I might build what I saw in my friend. Would I have it? Of course I would build step two. All right. I think we're going to stop right there. That's I think that's a cool place to stop. He's like, yep, let's do this thing. I'm willing. Let's let's hear what you've got to say. Thank you.